Hello, today is November 17th, 2013. We're meeting today with Mr. Robert Weideman at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Robert, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you for being here, and thanks for the invite. <laughs> You're welcome. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, uh, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Uh, I was born October 17, 1943, in Montreal, Canada. Uh, my mother uh, was a Royal Canadian Air Force nurse. My father was a pilot in the Royal Canadian Air Force, although he was an American citizen. Hmm. Uh, when the United States entered the war after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, the U.S. government uh, purchased my father and about 100 other Americans up there to come and fly uh, for the United States. So my dad went, went into the Army Air Corps and uh, he flew the hump in World War II for a couple years. Uh, three months after I was born, uh, my family moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where my grandmother was. That would be my father's mother. And uh, I lived in Cleveland until I was about nine years old. Uh, my father at that time was at Minneapolis Honeywell. And he uh, was transferred to Buffalo, New York, so we moved to East Aurora when I was in fourth grade, and I was about nine years old. Um, I really grew up in East Aurora, New York. Uh, my last year, my father sent me away to Manlius Military School in Syracuse for my senior year. And, uh, I graduated, graduated in 1961 from Manlius. Uh, that summer, my father was transferred back again to Cleveland, so we moved to Bay Village, Ohio. Uh, that would be Dr. Sam Shepard fame. And my mother, actually, she was a nurse at his uh, ortho uh, osteopathic hospital. Yeah. I went to the University of Toledo for two years, studied chemical engineering. And in uh, my second year, my sophomore year, the U.S. Navy uh, had the recruiters up there and, and they had a NAVCAD program, uh, which had two years of college, uh, you could go into the Navy flight program. Uh, all the other programs were pretty much uh, for you, you needed four years of college. I took the tests and that summer, uh, the Navy told me that, that I had been accepted into their program. And had you always had an interest in flying or what? Uh... I had had, I mean, I flew, uh, my, my father actually taught me to fly. I think I was in an airplane when I was eight years old. Oh, really? Huh? He, he taught me how to fly when I was like 14, you know. Uh, actually, uh, my father, after he got out of the Air Force after World War II, he was a, he promoted the Cleveland Air Races and he instructed before he went to work for Minneapolis Honeywell. That would be the Bendix Air Races. So yes, I've always had interest in aviation, and this was a chance, uh, you know, for me to, to, that was a dream, actually. So I, I reported uh, in August of, of 1963, after my second year of school, um, the Navy accepted me into the program, and I reported Pensacola on October the 16th, and I turned 20 years old the next day on the 17th, uh -huh. okay? Uh, so uh, the, the flight program was a year and a half, had four, four months of pre-flight. And in May of 65, I got my wings and my commission. The Navy sent me to Newport, Rhode Island for just a school for two months. It was a wonderful uh, uh, a tour. Uh, that would be in the summer of 1965. They had the Newport Jazz Festival and just had the time of my life. Was also introduced to law because uh, the Justice School was like eight weeks long and there was like seven or eight lawyers and, and my dad always told me to, well, quit mumbling, you know, speak up. And these guys were great. We had three, uh, three courses, uh, substantive law, procedure, and evidence, and they made it a joy. Uh, little did I know that, that when, when I actually did go to law school years later, uh, I was deceived because <laughs> law school was not that fun. Uh, at any rate, so I get through that, went to, uh, uh, to the replacement air group in Lamore, California in September 1965 to learn how to fly the A-4. And in January 66, Tom Wonder Jim and I, we reported aboard the ship on Yankee Station uh, in January of 1966, right in the middle of operations on the USS Enterprise. Uh, I believe that first cruise I had like 94 missions. I survived, came back in June of 66, and uh, met my wife, and we got married in July of of 66. It's like one of my sons tells me, he says, Dad, what were you thinking? You know, 
Anyway, uh, so we got married, and then I went back out on cruise in January of 67 on the USS Hancock. Got about 40 more missions, and uh, I got bagged on May the 6th, 1967. Uh, I didn't come home until March of 1973, uh, five years, ten months later. Actually, 70, uh, 70 months of the Babylonian captivity, oh, I boy. call it. Boy. Uh, Let me interrupt you. We'll, uh, yes. and we'll get into this, uh, talking about this career as, you, as you've uh, uh, moved through it. Um, one thing I'm fascinated about, talk a little bit about uh, landing on an aircraft carrier. I mean, this little postage stamp out in the middle of nowhere, I'm just amazed by, by that and what's all involved with that and how that was, that experience was for you and initially. Right. Uh, well, you know, what can I say? Uh, actually, uh, you know, it's really hard to describe. You do have a, you, you have a glide path reference, it's called the lens and the meatball. And as long as you can keep uh, uh, the meatball, uh, even with the datum lights, you're on the glide path. And, uh, you know, you, you have an attitude for your airplane, uh, which is constant, which will maintain the right airspeed. And then you just use your power to go up or down on the glide path, higher or lower. Uh, daytime is not so bad. Uh, uh, it gets pretty dicey at night uh, because you don't have any depth perception and everything is black, you know. And all you have are the runway lights and uh, your, your meatball and, and datum lights on the lens. Mm. Uh, that's where most of your accidents uh, happen would be at night. Uh, funny story, uh, I convinced myself by the time I got shot down uh, that I really love this stuff. You know, I love flying off carriers. I love dropping bombs. I love getting shot at. Uh, I, love, I love night work on a carrier, you know. Well... After I'd been in, the, in jail for about a year, a year and a half, I had a dream. And the dream was, I'm back on the Hancock, 2 o'clock in the morning, the lights are red, we're briefing for another mission, a launch. And I woke up in a cold sweat, and I can see the mosquito net above me, and then we had the 24-hour light in the middle of the room hanging down on about a six-foot cord was lit. And I woke up and the thought that went through my mind was, oh, thank God, I'm only in a communist prison camp. <laughs> uh, a lot of people laugh at that, but you know, if, if you go back, uh, read the book of Daniel and his dreams, it really meant something to me. Uh, you know, because that, that's, that, that's really how I felt about it, even though I was able to cover it up uh, like that. Wow. So yeah, the landing at night, uh, that's pretty dicey. Yeah, yeah. And what was it, uh, altogether, how many missions did you fly before you were shot down? I'm going to say over 120. Wow, wow. And, and what's it like, uh, once again, I'm trying to get a perspective from somebody that's never been in harm's way like that, flying off the carrier, know you're flying into potential trouble. Mm -hmm. What? And to me, there, I'm thinking of the three parts of a, of a, of a mission, taking off in, into the mission, being actually over on the mission, and then that night when you're back home and and you're laying in your cot and you're able to decompress, what's, what, what goes through a person's mind when, uh, I guess, taking the first part, flying in, flying off knowing you're going into harm's way? I mean, uh, or do you think about it? Well, you've got so many procedures to think about, it sort of keeps your mind off that part of it. Um, my very first mission, I'm on the Fantail. I believe uh, Johnny Tapp was, was the flight leader, Lieutenant Commander Tapp, who, uh, who, ended up killing, got killed uh, uh, that cruise, my first cruise on the Enterprise. Mm. But when the ship turned into the wind, uh, about that time, uh, the plane captain's hand, handing me uh, my, my knee board, my helmet and all that. Well, the ship turns in the wind and catches my knee board and all my maps, all my frequencies, everything I ever had went over the fantail. Oh, boy. You know, my very first mission. Uh, if Johnny got shot down on that mission, I would not have had a clue where I was. Uh, that said, the first half a dozen missions, I was just scared out of my wits. Every time we crossed the beach in the North Vietnam, I just knew that I was going to get shot down on mm. the spot. And this went on for about uh, about the first six missions. Uh, it's kind of like my first six trials. Uh, the first six trials is, you know, like, you know, where am I? Uh, it takes about six trials to figure it out. After about a half a dozen missions and I didn't get shot down, then... 
then I started to see the pattern, you know, and, and there's certain places that were flak traps that, that you didn't fly over, because uh, if you did, you're going to get bagged. And, and you could usually avoid most of them. There was probably out of 120 missions, probably, uh, I could count on maybe a half a dozen where I actually saw myself being shot at. And there was two or three of them, uh, a couple of them were over the city of Vin, where, you know, you're going over the target, you're in the target area for five minutes, and there's no way you can avoid it. You can see the flashes on the ground. Uh, you, you can see the, the flak puffs above you. Uh, you could, what was amazing, you could actually hear the muzzle blast and you could see the shock waves of the you know 57 85 millimeter and aircraft uh, muzzles uh, going across the rice fields um, in fact this one particular mission <laughs> this is kind of a funny story this would be my first cruise on the enterprise dad Erie was was a flight leader there was four of us I was like number two and earlier that week we got a load of chaff Chaff is, is what the B-17s used mm -hmm. in Germany uh, to deflect the, uh, the AAA, the anti-aircraft fire. Well, you know, our use, okay, we're going to use chaff, and who's going to carry it? Well, Weidman's the ensign. He's the junior officer. He gets to carry the chaff. And what we did in the A-4 was, of course, we had the hook. Uh, you could put the chaff and raise your hook, hold the chaff in, and then when it came time to release the chaff, you drop the hook, and, and the chaff is gone. Anyway, so we're, we're headed, in fact, in this particular mission, it was, it was like about three carriers. We probably had about 60 airplanes. And, uh, you know, you come at, Nam Din is like 10 miles from the coast. And we cross the beach, and sadly, we're like at 200 knots. Normally, with the A4 Charlie, 250 was the minimum. And the Echo, 300 was the minimum. But there was a flight leader, uh, I forgot his name, from another squadron. And we're coming at 200 knots, and we could see the flak puffs. Uh, over the city of Vin, and at 10 miles, we still had maybe another minute and a half, you know, to go, two minutes. And finally, someone comes up uh, over the radios and says, airspeed, airspeed, you know. And finally, our airspeed started to increase, and what our goal was, was we were going to circle uh, uh, the city of Nam Din uh, to the north and hook back around so that when we dove in, we'd be heading east uh, toward uh, the Tonkin Gulf in case we got hit then we could glide to the water and eject there. Well, so we're coming around there. Now, sadly, we had an overcast at about 10,000 feet, and that was our rolling altitude. Something else uh, uh, you're told is you don't want to come in under an overcast because the enemy, the gunners, know how high the overcast is, and they can just cut their fuses for that altitude. So we're about 9,500 feet. And all, you can see the muzzle flashes and all this, and it, it wasn't bad, you know, there's a few flak puffs that kind of slow motion going by. And uh, Dad Airy comes on the radio and says, Chaff, now. So I dropped the hook, and almost immediately, the gunners had my altitude, uh, my azimuth, they had everything. And it's like every gun all of a sudden focused on me. Oh, jeez. And I have to tell you, uh, that plane was jumping around, bouncing. My helmet was bouncing off the canopy so much, I actually got a headache. And uh, at any rate, we get through that, and, and uh, we roll in, and uh, we, we bomb our target was the rail yards. We bomb those, and then we headed east, and we come back to the ship. Well... After we get back and land, R.C. Moore, who was number three, he was saying, Bobby, he says, I, I thought we lost you, Bobby. He says, your plane was just covered, you know, with, 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 with the, uh, the flak puffs. And uh, miraculously, uh, I, I never got a scratch. Really? So, huh. Yeah, huh. every now and then. Huh. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, yeah, the first six missions, uh, I was scared to death 100% of the time, anytime I was over the beach. Uh, after that, you kind of settle down into a routine, you know, and, and you know that, that uh, you know, a city like Nam Din is going to be tough. Uh, on my second cruise, uh, I was targeted, uh, Kep was our target, and three times it got canceled, so I never did uh, get up to Hanoi. Uh, anyway, that's pretty much uh, yeah. what, I, as far as coming back to the ship, uh, daytime is no big deal. At nighttime, uh, you know, we had the we had the marshal, 
about 20, uh, probably about 40 miles uh, to the rear of the ship, and then we shoot our individual approaches. Uh, one of the things is uh, you're coming down 6,000 foot a minute, 250 knots, and you hit platform at five mile, 5,000 feet or 20 miles, it, it comes up like that, and then you reduce your, your rate of descent uh, to 2,000 feet, and then, and then it's a straight into the ship at night. Um, and then you trap, and everybody's happy. <laughs> wow. So your bombing would be more low-level bombing, and what, what would you be... Uh... Actually, we, uh, this, most of our, well, you know, in South Vietnam, we drop napalm. That would be uh, maybe 5 or 10 degree dives. Uh, uh, rockets uh, be about 30 degrees. Over North Vietnam, uh, I mean, I'm thinking uh, 45, 60 degrees at 100, because you want to get out of there. Yeah. In fact, most of the, all the practice is 450 knots, uh, 45 degrees angle of bank. We found out if you have a 90 degree, uh, you're actually more accurate because you, you don't have the, the, the angle to worry about. Uh, but that, you know, that can get a little dicey too. But generally, because you, you're, you're in formation, you can't do a 90 degree dive in formation. Right. So I would say that most of the time between 45 and 60 degree dive angles, at military power, which is 100%, you're probably looking at uh, 500 knots at the bottom. Wow, wow. And, and so primarily you were attacked by, by flak, or, what, was it, or were, were you shot at with missiles? Well, at actually on my second cruise, uh, of course I survived, and then on May yeah. the 6th, uh, it was a coastal wrecking. We saw a barge down there that was not worth the price of a plane or a pilot, and as, as most of the targets in North Vietnam were that way. Right. We rolled in on the barge at about 10,000 feet, 11,000 feet, and then when we rolled out, I felt a metallic click, and the plane kept rolling. Uh, before we rolled in, uh, there was no enemy uh, defenses, no SAMs, no MiGs, no AAA. Uh, it was a beautiful day. You could see the ship. It was 100 miles away, according to the plane's navigation system. To be honest, I didn't think you could see that far. Hmm. Uh, and as I rolled out, felt a metallic click. The stick was all the way over to the left. I tried to get it back to the center, uh, no luck, the plane just kept rolling, and then I saw 6,000 feet go by, and it was like, whoa, I've got to get out of here. So I pulled the face curtain, and uh, at those air speeds, the wind, uh, it's like hitting a brick wall, and, and, and I saw stars. And then, uh, then I remembered that I had to hold my, I did not want my legs or my arms to flail in the wind so I held them together and, and I saw the sky, the earth, the sky, the earth. Oh, and during this time I remembered Tom Sisler uh, was a friend of mine. He was the first uh, A7 pilot killed earlier that year at Lemoore and as he was saying uh, his last transmissions were it won't work, it won't work, it won't work. So I just prayed to the Lord even though I wasn't a believer then uh, Lord, make it work. Lord, make it work. And then the chute opened. Felt no pain. Hmm. I looked out. Uh, the coast was about two miles away. It was beautiful. You could hear a pin drop. Uh, I thought about my wife, uh, my family. You know, felt really bad for them. And uh, then it was time to get to work. So I looked up the parachute, and it was like a Roman candle. It hadn't opened completely. So uh, the parachute people told us that when you have that, reach up with your, with your hands on the parachute risers and pull them apart, and the chute might open. Well, I did that, and the chute did open, so it was lucky me. Uh, I looked down, time to communicate, so I pulled out, I had two radios over North Vietnam. I pulled one out, and you guessed it, I dropped it. <laughs> so, uh, what an idiot. So, uh, I got the next one, I got about two transmissions out. You know, Raven Lee, this is two. Raven Lee, this is two. And then I could hear the people on the ground, which meant I'm about 500 feet uh, from landing. And so I got prepared to land. And, and the parachute people uh, say, don't, you, don't want, you don't want to land going forwards or backwards. You want to land going sideways. We had about a 25-knot crosswind that day. And I did all I could to be landing sideways. But you know, luck would have it, I landed going backwards. And I hit the side of a trench. Mm. And I have to tell you, it hurt. And it hurt a lot. Now, you talk to the parachute people, I say, well, landing in a parachute is just like jumping off a 12-foot fence. You know, well, I submit to you, you go jump off a 12-foot fence, so it hurts a lot. Ugh. At any rate, so there I am. I was able to get one 
uh, of the parachute risers off uh, with my left hand. I couldn't get the, the right one off because my two fingers had been broken in the ejection. And so I'm kind of, you know, I'm not being dragged, but I'm, I'm being, you know, held up by the wind. And about maybe 50, 100 feet away, there's this uh, Vietnamese soldier with a pith helmet, his insignia on his collar, his, his hands outstretched, and behind him there's 500 to uh, 200 people. He was just waiting to see what I was going to do. Uh, his eyeballs are about the size of baseballs. I'm sure mine were about the size of basketballs. So I showed him what he wanted to see. I raised my palms up, and he dropped his hands, and the Vietnamese villagers rushed me. And I don't think they ever saw a zipper because they had me stripped onto my shorts in about 30 seconds using only knives. They cut me out of everything, the parachute harness, uh, uh, the, the G-suit, uh, my flight suit, everything. Uh, during that period, one of them uh, tried to take my ID card that was in, in the shoulder, my left shoulder of my flight suit, and I slapped him. I slapped <laughs> his hand away because... Uh, you know, my government told me that, uh, well, if you, if you don't have an ID card, they can try you as a spy. Well, when I did that, there's a young kid in front of me, about 14 years old, had one of these old Springfield rifles. They all had this old Springfield rifles, and he fixed the he fixes the bayonet, which was a French bayonet, which was a four-sided, so when they poke you, you bleed to death, whereas American bayonets are, are just a single, it's more of a slice, slicing attack. Well... He lowers that bayonet to my navel, and the two soldiers on either side are holding my shoulders, and he runs around into the chamber. Well, I'm thinking of that movie, The Bridges of Tokori, came out in about 1955, about uh, uh, a Navy pilot named was Harry Brubaker, played by William Holden. And at the end of that movie, uh, William, uh, he gets shot down, and he's in a muddy trench in Korea. And at the end of that movie, uh, the Koreans, uh, they shoot and kill him in the trench. So I'm thinking, you know, this is just like that movie. Uh, this kid's going to blow me away. No one's going to know about it. And not only that, there's no music playing in the background. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very cold feeling. Uh -huh. Well, about that time, uh, an old Vietnamese farmer, white hair, goatee, he shows up and, and he gives that kid an elbow. And that's the last I saw of the kid. So... Uh, you know, I'm grateful to, to that old Vietnamese farmer. He probably saved my life. At any rate, uh, we get gathered up, and we probably walk or run maybe 50 to 100 yards into a big uh, bamboo hut. And uh, they sit me down on the dirt. Uh, some young lady there, uh, I'd say 16 years old, in black pajamas. She's got a rubber sandal, and she's beat me about the, the face with it. Uh, to be honest, I never felt it. Uh, I was probably in shock. Then they put a blindfold around on me, and we waited for about 45 minutes till the rescue airplanes went away. Uh, they showed up, and there was a serious war. You could hear the, the machine guns, the anti-aircraft. You could hear the jet noises uh, for about 45 minutes, just, just a war going on. And I found out later, uh, much later, that some of those airplanes did, in fact, get hit, but they were all able to make it back to the ship. After 45 minutes, the planes go away. I take the blindfold off of me. There was a soldier uh, sitting on a bed uh, just above me, and, and he hands me a cigarette. And this lady that had been hit me in the face with the sandals, she brings me uh, a demitas of hot tea. So, you know, go figure. <laughs> so I drink the tea, smoke the cigarette. And it's time to go. And we start walking toward the mountains. Mountains are about uh, 10 miles from the coast. I was already two miles in. So we had another six to eight miles to go. And this is probably one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so we start walking. And on the way to the mountains, uh, we went through about a half a dozen villages. Uh, there's about six or seven guards with me with these Springfield rifles. And each village, uh, the villagers would come out and start throwing rocks at me, trying to beat me with sticks and clubs. Uh, but uh, you're not going to believe this, those soldiers crisscrossed their weapons above my head and <laughs> they actually got beat up more than I do. Hmm. Uh, I, I also found out recently that there was another prisoner in the Hanoi area, Haiphong area. He experienced the same thing with the soldiers trying to keep him away from the villages. No doubt in my mind that if the villagers had me and the soldiers weren't there, uh, they would have lynched me. Yeah. 
Uh, at any rate, so this happened about a half a dozen times and uh, probably about just before the sun goes down, this is in May, uh, we get to the mountains and the uh, Vietnamese served me my first meal. And it was a cup of rice with some green stuff on it, like maybe bamboo shoots. Uh, had uh, something on top of the bamboo shoots that looked like uh, pineapple, tasted like a potato. And on top of all that was, was a fish head. Of course, you know, you hear the old thing, you know, fish heads and rice is what the Vietnamese eat. So I removed the fish head and all the guards around me laughed. And I ate the rest of it. About that time the sun goes down, the trucks come out. And we're up there in the foothills, and there was a path, uh, a road, dirt road, probably, uh, you know, maybe 50, 75 feet from us. And there was a truck all night long going four to maybe eight miles an hour. Uh, they were 50 to 100 yards apart, heading south all night long. The only time those trucks stopped would be every hour and 40 minutes, every hour and 45 minutes, a couple airplanes uh, from my ship, because we had designated route packages, and this was our route package where I got bagged. And the first airplane would have flares. First of all, you'd hear the engines, and all the trucks would stop and turn their lights off. <laughs> now, they'd already punched out the front headlamps, put another light on a bumper with a cover over that light on the bumper, so you couldn't see it from the air, but when they heard the engines, everything stopped, the lights went out, and they just sat there until the first airplane dropped the flares. And when that happened, every AAA within, I'm gonna say five counties was shooting th at the flares, because they knew that's where the other airplane would be rolling in. And the, the sky was just filled up with little orange balls, which were the tracers of every fifth round of a 37 millimeter was a tracer. And then the other airplane would come in, drop the bombs, and they'd head, head back to sea. Uh, that whole thing didn't take more than five minutes. Uh, the trucks would start up again and head south for another hour and 40 minutes. That was one of the most distressing parts to me because some admiral came aboard uh, in February of that year during Tet and says, you know, these guys can't last more than a couple years. Uh, we, are, we are stopping 98% of the supplies. Well, that was wrong. Uh, and I actually had a chance to, you know, fast forward. Uh, one of my law school classes was American legal history. And Hermit Hall was the professor. And, and Ronald Reagan uh, uh, summoned him to White Washington to give him an award for the best American legal history professor. Well, after I got a B out of him, which was good for me. And so after I got my grade, I went in to talk to him. And I discovered at that point that in 68 and 69, he was in the U.S. Army. And he was flying over uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail every day for like two years, 68 and 69, in a constellation of all airplanes. And he was saying, you know, we needed, three, we needed 1,200 sorties a day over the Ho Chi Minh Trail to have any effect to stop him. He says, we could only put up 300, so we just never had a chance. At any rate, uh, the Admiral was wrong, and I believe that's a generous assessment. Hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, that being said, uh, they threw me on one of those trucks shortly after that. We headed south for about 30 minutes, uh, put me in a Jeep. I'm sorry, then we got off and, and we had to walk east for about another 30 minutes, so the Vietnamese wanted to carry my wanted me to carry my ejection seat. I couldn't do it, so they went ahead and carried it for me, the guards. And uh, that 30 minute talk, uh, there was like checkpoints every 15 or 20 minutes. We could hear in the shadows at night, you know, doing passwords. So we get to a, a, a hut. There's a big mound in the hut. They put me on on top of the mound, and I fall asleep. Well, I woke up. I don't know if it was an hour later, two hours later. It was dark, and I had the incredible thirst in my throat. I mean, I've never been so thirsty in all my life. Well, all I could say is water, water. Well, there was a, a Vietnamese lady there. She comes up on that mound w with a canteen and, 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 and gives me some water. And I mean, I must have drunk, you know, two of those. And uh, at any rate, uh, a Jeep pulls up, and they load me into the Jeep again. This time we head east or head west. 
probably for another, you know, 30, 45 minutes. And then we unload. This time I'm blindfolded. I'm tied. My hands are tied behind my back. And we uh, walk, uh, not through the rice paddies, but on the, you know, the, the, the walkway above the mm -hmm. rice paddies. Probably 100 yards into a hut. Sit me down on a two by four with my arms tightly tied behind my back. Just sitting there. I could hear something in the background sound like an alligator. Uh, later turned out to be like an opium pipe. And uh, uh, I thought there was an alligator. They're going to throw me to the alligators. Mm. But you know, your mind gets real weird in situations sure. like that. So anyway, um, I make the statement, you know, could you guys untie uh, my hands because they're, you know, they're really starting to hurt. It's cutting through, you know. And in this Vietnamese voice I hear, do you want to complain about it? <laughs> well, you know, I got the picture, just shut my mouth. And a couple minutes later, they stand me up, untie my hands, I turn around, and there's, uh, there's a desk. There's a guy called Soupy Sales. He had a baseball hat on sideways. He had a man bag. I'm going to say he was about 65 years old with a goatee, 60-ish maybe. And then the guy next to him was a soldier, probably in his late 20s, with a pith helmet and olive drab suit. Uh, the old guy was uh, was dressed in civilian uh, civilian clothes. Robert, where we left off, you were uh, now in that hut. You've got that old man and that soldier. Uh, take your story from there. Okay, uh, well, the, the soldier was doing all the talking. The old guy was just sitting there listening. And the soldier says, what's your name? I says, Robert Weidman. He says, how old are you? I says, 23. He says, uh, 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 wh wh where do you live? I says, well, my government will not let me answer that question. He says, if you not, do not answer that question, I'll have my guards take you out and shoot you. Well, I worked up a tear because I wanted him to believe that I believed that he would indeed shoot me if I didn't tell him where I was from. And uh, he asked me again, I says, you know, uh, my government, I'd really like to answer that question, but my government will not let me do that. And he, uh, we went through that drill about, you know, two or three times, four times. And to be honest, uh, before I got bagged, uh, our government was telling me that if we get shot down over North Vietnam, they're going to try to get us to Hanoi. But if we get shot down in South Vietnam or Laos, uh, that's a different story because we'd be captured by guerrillas and they just didn't have the resources to keep us going. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the reasons that when I, when I flew over South Vietnam or Laos, I carried a pistol and a radio because I plan on shooting it out with them. But over North Vietnam, I, I got rid of the gun and I carried two radios instead. Uh, so I really, you know, I didn't think they'd shoot me, but y you don't really know. Well, well, can I ask you, when you said you, you worked up that tear to, uh, to, to show that you were afraid that you might shoot him, is that, are, are, are you uh, playing off your own thoughts or, or did you guys have any sort of training for in case you were shot down and, and how to act or how, how did that, what thought process that made you decide to, to shed that tear? Right, well that had nothing to do with what with, with I was briefed. All we were briefed on in POW school and some of the training we did, we did have two weeks of uh, SEER training, uh, survival, escape and evasion, you know. Uh, what what I was told was that don't talk and don't lie because these interrogators are experts. And if you tell them anything more than name, rank, serial number, date of birth, in other words, if you give them information they want to know, once they have the information, they don't need you and they're going to kill you. That's what I was told. Uh, uh, that turned out to be incredibly wrong. Hmm. Uh, at any rate, so we went through uh, this back and forth a few times, and finally uh, the soldier says, all right, now I'm going to have my guards take you out and garrote you. So I'm thinking James Bond from Russia with Love, uh, Sean Connery, uh, the piano wire around the throat trick, you know. And I'm thinking, boy, this will be great. Well, the guards... There was two other guards there. They put me down on my knees, and they had a, a bamboo rope that was about the size of 
diameter of my small finger. And it was very coarse rope. And they tied, they tied that, they tied each uh, above each elbow, and then they cinched it down to about the size, right to the bone, about the size mm. of a nickel. And what that felt like, it felt just like white hot barbed wire cutting into my skin. Uh, and, it, and it wouldn't go away. Now, you know, when I grew up, I played football, I played hockey, I boxed a little bit, did judo. In those sports, when you get hit, you might see stars, but you know, then you're conscious again. And, and for the most part, the pain, it's not constant. This was a constant pain. It just never went away. And it did not take long to realize that I'm not gonna be able to deal with this. I've gotta come up with something so I don't talk. So I'm looking at that, I'm kneeling down in front of this desk. And my head was just above the edge of the desk. And I says, you know, if I can fall forward and hit my head on the desk and knock myself out, that'll do it. Hmm. So I did that. Well, sadly, when I hit my, when my head hit the edge of the desk, that just made me more alert. And so the guard or, or the soldier, the interpreter, he pulls my head back and I got tears coming down and he starts laughing. Well, during this, when my head hit, hit that desk, I could hear this groan. And I looked over in the shadows into this hut and there was like 25 or 30 people watching this that I hadn't noticed before. There was grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, son, grandson, grandkids, <laughs> aunts, uncles, nephews, you know, there's about 30 of them. And, you know, I was, the, I was the entertainment for these folks that night. At any rate, uh, He pulls my head back, you know, and stands me back up on my knees, and, and I'm there. And I look down at my hands, and they're like a bright, dark purple. I mean, the, 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 the blood circulation had been cut off. And he looks down, and he whispers. He says, you know, if you don't talk pretty soon, your arms are going to fall off. So I have to tell you, that worried me. At any rate, you know, Got through that, I'm still there. Probably a few minutes later, five minutes later, who knows how long it was. Uh, this, my body starts to convulse uncontrollably, my muscles. And this scream comes out, primal scream. And at the top of my lungs, I scream, I will never talk. Hmm. And about five minutes later, I look up, I says, if you undo the ropes, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Well. He undoes the ropes, they stand me up. He says, what city are you from? I says, Cleveland, Ohio. He says, okay, Robert, now you may go to sleep. And uh, at that point, uh, there was a two by four inside this little uh, part of the room that was separated by a bamboo wall. And they hog tied me to the rope and then they had some chains around my feet around and they went around like a telephone pole. I wasn't moving very much. Uh, I remember I had a dream that night uh, that I had to go to the bathroom, but before I could go to the bathroom, I had to reach up and there was a ring on this telephone pole that I had to reach up and grab. And so I'm struggling and struggling and struggling. I finally get up there and I grab this ring and then I was able to urinate. And it was just like such a relief. And I look down and I realize that I'm awake. And I've just urinated all over the board and all over my underwear, you know. And meanwhile, the guard that was outside uh, comes in and he looks and he kind of goes, tch, 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 you know. At uh, any rate, that was, that's happened that first night. Well, the next morning, I can hear some shuffling. And then I hear, so now you are my prisoner. Okay. You know, so they, the guards come in and they untie me and get me off the board. And I said, well, it's this guy, Soupy Sales, all by himself, speaking English, <laughs> you know, with his man bag. And he, uh, he starts asking questions. Well, what's your name? Uh, are you married? Yeah. How many children? I have no children. He said, I have one. I found out later that no matter how many children you had, he always had one more. Okay. Uh, so he starts talking about this benign stuff, you know, uh, do you like, you watch soccer, uh, football, baseball, you know, and then he would say, well, what was your dive angle? <laughs> and I said, well, I says, uh, you know, I'd like to answer that question, but my government won't let me. 
He says, do you remember what happened last night? I says, yes, I do. He says, what was your dive angle? I says, oh, my dive angle is anywhere from five degrees to 90 degrees. He says, okay. Well, what do you think of the what do you think of the Cleveland Indians? <laughs> you know, and we start. He starts talking about all this other stuff, you know, uh, and then he says, uh, "What was your release altitudes?" And says, "Oh, my release altitude anywhere from, you know, 500 feet up to uh, 15,000." And then he'd go. This went on for like a week, huh. during the day. It was amazing. Uh, they just. I found out later they know all the answers. Uh, they just want you to talk, you know. Well, about a week later, they tossed me into a truck, and there's another man there. His actual name was Mike McCushion. He would turn out to be my first roommate on the 30th of, on the 1st of June. Well, the first night it rained, and I'll tell you, you know, 45 degrees at night in the summertime, uh, I about froze to death. Uh, we, we were chained to each other, blindfolded, and I tried to crawl into every freaking hole that Mike McCushion had, his armpits, his knees, his crotch, you know, <laughs> just to get warm. And uh, survived the night. It was a miracle. Why I didn't get pneumonia is a miracle. Uh -huh. uh, the next morning, uh, they unloaded us from the truck. I actually jumped off the truck, and I found out I had no legs. I basically landed because all the muscles had been pulled, and there was nothing there. Uh -huh. I basically landed on my tailbone, and how I didn't break my back, I was pretty lucky there, too. But they put us in a hut, and Mike's about 30, 40 feet away. He told me later he could hear my, my knees chattering uh, for like about two to four hours. You know, I mean, I was just trembling. Uh, one thing about this hut was that you had three big pictures. Uh, you had Lenin, Ho Chi Minh, Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was, was in color. The other two were black and white. They were all like maybe, uh, I don't know, four feet by three. They're pretty big pictures along one of the walls, but next to the door, there's this little picture maybe 12 by 12, a foot by a foot. It was Jesus Christ on a cross. Really? Huh. And Jesus was a gook. I know that's not politically yeah. correct, yeah. but he was a Vietnamese. Huh. He had slanted eyes, brown skin, little uh, black goatee, you know. And what blew me away about this was that, of course, we were told, well, you know, they don't have any religion, freedom of religion in, in a communist country. Well, right there, something did not compute because here it was, you know. At any rate, so we spend the day in the hut, and then at nighttime, another truck combined, they load us on the truck. Well, this was a routine for this. It took us four days to get to Hanoi. We got to Hanoi on the 19th. The second night was pretty much uneventful. The third night, we got bombed. Now, on this trip up at night, whenever you'd hear the airplane engines, the trucks would always stop, the lights would always go off. We'd just sit there till the planes went away. Well, this one particular time on the third night, you could hear the airplane engines, but the truck wasn't stopping and the lights were still on. And and then we could start hearing bombs, you know, whatever. It was, the, 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 actually the plane engines were getting louder and louder. And finally the guards, about a half a dozen, they were getting scared. They were pounding on the back window of the truck cab, you know, and, trying to go around in the front to get the driver's attention. And finally, the truck stops, the lights go out, and the guards boogie. And Mike and I, we're sitting in this truck, chained together. We couldn't go anywhere. And I didn't know it at the time, but we had airplanes. Uh, it sounded like planes were going over 200 feet. You know, we never, we, we couldn't do that in the A-4. But there was bombs, there was rockets, there was anti-aircraft. I mean, it was a serious, and we're right in the middle of it. And I'm thinking, like, we're toast. No way we're going to survive this. I, 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 I peeked through the bottom part of my blindfold into the western sky, and the whole sky was covered up with these orange balls, uh, which would be the tracers of your 37-millimeter uh, uh, anti-aircraft. And they were going away from us, so we couldn't see any motion. They were just hanging. But the whole Western sky, it was, it was the best fireworks show I've ever seen in my life to date. <laughs> and probably till the, I mean, it was actually beautiful, scary, but yeah. beautiful. So anyway, uh, the planes go away, the guards, before the guards come back, Mike and I are there by ourselves, you know, and he sort of made the understatement of the year. He says, man, he says, that was scary. <laughs> like, yeah, brother. <laughs> anyway, the guards come back. We head on north. The rest of the night was uneventful. Stayed in a hut. And uh, 
on the fourth night of the 19th, we showed up in Hanoi. I'm, I'm speculating about one o'clock in the morning. Could hear a, a train whistle in the distance. And we're at the front gate of the, of the Hanoi Hilton, the, the Wallow. Well, they rushed me into this green knobby room and they took Mike some other place. Well, the next morning, of course, it was the 19th and we had a lot of air raids. They had so many air raids that they couldn't get to me. Uh, finally, uh, about four o'clock that afternoon, the air raids kind of quieted down and uh, they, they, they had me blindfolded and they put me in a, uh, by the way, in this, uh, in this rune had grob, uh, uh, knobby green walls, uh, I, I think, to, to stop the uh, acoustics. If you screamed, they wouldn't hear. Mm. And there was a big hook hanging down from the ceiling, and there was a 10-foot long bar in the corner. Uh, there was some food on the table, uh, and they had a couple bananas that were like black, uh, black skin. So I ate the food, which is okay, you know, rice and vegetables and you know, maybe a piece of uh, pig fat or something. But I stayed away from the, the bananas because I thought they were rotten. Well, they, they blindfolded me after the raid stopped and, and, and marched me, uh, walked me into a little cell. And, and before the door was shut, the guard says, don't take off your blindfold, you know. Slams the door shut, locks it, you know. I'm sitting there, I don't hear anybody in this room. So, I take my blindfold off, and I wish I hadn't, because I'm in like a six foot by four foot cell, had a couple of uh, concrete beds on either side. Each one had some wooden stocks at the end where they could put your feet. Uh, looks like it was whitewashed, but hadn't been whitewashed in freaking 20 years. So the ceilings were about 25 feet tall. I found out later because they have no air conditioning, the hot air in the mm. summer goes to the top. So that's how they get some of the hot air out of ground level. So I'm sitting there, I hear this blood curdling scream in the background, you know, obviously another prisoner. And it was like, whoa, you know. And I'm thinking to myself that, well, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, I read the book when I was, you know, teenager or, or that age. And it's about this guy who was, who was, who was, uh, falsely convicted and put in a dungeon for like 30 years, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is just like the Count of Monte Cristo, but hey, this is 1967. This stuff doesn't happen anymore. I immediately went down on my knees and I says, Lord, I feel like a hypocrite because I really don't believe in you. Uh, but you know, if there's anything you can do to help me out here, uh, I'd really, really appreciate it, you know. Uh, about that time, uh, there was an air raid, and so I got underneath one of the beds, and as I was looking up, I could see scratched in this concrete this, this calendar for about six months. And above that was like D. Luna, who I later met, David Luna, you know, three years ago, he was my roommate. Wow. But what was distressing was, was he X'd out this calendar. There was like six months worth of stuff. I said, man, some guy was here for six months? You know, I said, oh, my God, you know, I said, hey, I ain't going to make it, you know. Anyway, so I was there, and I believe uh, either that, that afternoon or the next one, uh, I was summoned to interrogation again. And it was this guy, Crooked Eye. Now, the North Vietnamese, uh, they don't have glasses, most of them, so one eye will be looking at you, and the other one will be, <laughs> you know, at 45 degrees off. He's got his pith helmet and desk, got his glass of tea, little stool for me to sit on again in the green knobby room. And you know, we go through the drill, what's your name, da 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 da. And uh, he says, how, how many missions do you have? I says, 90. I actually had 120, two cruises. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't like that. He says, no way. He says, you had more. I says, no. He says, all right, you'll be punished. So they send me back to my room. They put, they crossed my legs before they put them in the stocks. Now, to be honest, it didn't hurt, but I just didn't get any sleep that night because every time you'd roll over, your big toe would dig into the concrete and, and you couldn't get any sleep, you know. So the next morning, guard comes by, talk. I go, yes, talk. He undoes me, goes back in to see Crooked Eye. He says, how many missions? I says, 90. He says, oh, that's not enough. And then he goes on. And uh, he asked me all these freaking questions. He asked me... Uh, 
he had a bunch of questions and you know we went back and forth but there was a series of six questions I lied about you know how many root packages do you have uh, how many destroyers out on the coast we actually had three I told him we had a hundred he <laughs> says uh, what, 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 what's the frequency of your identification friend or foe transponder I lied about that because I didn't think there was any way he would know because my first cruise we didn't have that so I'm figuring this is new stuff you know and there was a few other questions he asked me and finally he says you lie and he slams his book shut and I got this real sick feeling in my stomach well his two guards come over and they do the same thing except this time they put my hands in manacles uh, manacles are like handcuffs with no chain in between it's just like a figure eight uh, they put your your behind my back and then they screw w w with a screw uh, that other part of it so that you have no play with your hands they do it behind the back and then take parachute shroud and although the pain it wasn't to the bone this time but they would tie it so your elbows touched well what that does first of all it hurts your shoulders big time and you can't breathe and you get claustrophobic and as he's walking out he says don't cry and he slams a, a, a broom in my mouth uh, not the stick but the the, the, the sweeping part mm -hmm. he sticks that in my mouth and they mm -hmm. walk out so I'm sitting there you know I mean, is he gonna be gone 20 minutes is he gonna be gone a day you know this is not fair I'm not gonna be able to deal with this well it comes back 20 minutes later Guards on time, he sits me back on the stool, he opens his book, he says, why did you lie? I says, because I'm stupid. And then he goes through those six questions and he, he, he answers every one correctly. And with that transponder frequency, he answered, it, he answered it to the decimal point. So these guys knew what I knew and the buku more. I mean, they knew it all. Uh, well, once, once we, once I understood that, and once we understood each other, uh, the interrogation went, uh, uh, you know, there was really uh, uh, nothing spectacular, except one time he asked me, we have a radar altimeter, and it's an AJB something, AJB35, AJB34, I mean, I, I, forgot the, I forgot the number. And he says, well, what, what, what's the number on this, you know? And I says, shoot, I says, I can't remember. And I realized then that when you're really in trouble with these guys is if they think you know the answer and you don't know the answer, you're in big trouble. Uh, at any rate, uh, he, he went on. And that was really my last serious interrogation. Hmm. Uh, they sent me back to my room. I got a shave. We were getting, you know, the water every day. We get f food twice a day. Uh, and then my first roommate showed up on the 1st of June, was Mike McCustion. Okay, so uh, Mike, Mike McCustion moves in, uh, and uh, in fact, just before, I, th th they put me into a separate cell on the other side of the camp, and we had, uh, it wasn't very big, uh, maybe uh, eight, uh, eight by eight with uh, two sets of bunk beds, you know. We could walk back and forth. But anyway, so I come in there, and then the door opens, and Mike comes in. And, God, here's a guy. Uh, uh, I mean, it looked like they chopped him up when they shaved him and all that stuff. And he walks in, and before the guard uh, closes the door, I look at Mike, and he looks at me. And then we bow like the Vietnamese, about a 30-degree bow. And then he closes the door. Well, I was just so happy to get room. We just talked all night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I think a couple days later, Dick Vogel, he was an Air Force major, he moved in. I recognized him when I was in that dungeon. I'm looking through the crack in the door, and here's this guy. He looked like he's 100 years old. He's bald on top, uh, uh, and his hair was like a donut, you know, above mm -hmm. his ears, and he had gray hair. I'm thinking, good God, what's this guy doing here? Well, that was Dick Vogel. He was like 35, <laughs> you know, and I'm 23. In fact... Uh, when Mike came in, in fact, Mike, I think Mike was already in that cell before I went in there. And he looks at me, he says, how old are you? I says, 23. He says, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, he, Mike was like 29 and one of the best people I ever lived with. Mm -hmm. uh, 
anyway, Dick Vogel moves in, and we're still in the Hilton probably for another month or so or three weeks, and then we get moved to the plantation, which was a new camp. And the three of us, we were in a pretty good sized room. I'm going to say uh, 15 by 30, the three of us. I mean, it was, we we're getting two meals a day, uh, like 10 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We get outside once a day for an hour, either to wash or uh, ourselves or to wash dishes. We're getting a bath uh, every day except Sunday. And uh, there was really no, no rough treatment, you know. Uh, and uh, we were able to set a communication with some of the other people. And this was a camp for, this was a new camp. I remember looking out there and there was Dick Stratton had a big pointed nose. He was the one that was on TV. Uh, they had him bowing and he looked like he was brainwashed. Uh, truth of the matter is, uh, that's how Dick Stratton looked. He looks brainwashed, just Dick Stratton, uh, which was actually a relief to me. Uh, so there we are. Um, and we had, uh, we had manila paper that we used for toilet paper, but we also used it to play cards. We made our own deck of cards hmm. and we played a lot of hearts. Uh, Dick Vogel got really upset because Mike and I were team, teaming up against him and we were always, we wouldn't let Dick win. <laughs> Dick was the major, uh, Mike was a captain and I was a Navy uh, Lieutenant JG. And then Dick let us know that uh, that wasn't right and he was probably right. Uh, I remember one time there that I was taken out for an interrogation and it was about the Zuni rockets and how they were detonated, you know. He says, well, is it radar or is it barometric altimeter that detonates the Zuni rocket? Well, the Zunis had, you could, you could program them for 50 feet or for 100 feet to detonate. And it was radar. And he, I says, well, it was, it's barometric. He says, no. He says, you must confess correctly or you'll be punished. He says, uh, what altitude do they detonate at? I says, uh, they detonate at 1,500 feet. He says, oh. He says, you must correct, confess correctly. And he leaves the room and he comes back in again. And he says, what altitude do they detonate? I says, how about 1,000 feet? He says, no, too high. <laughs> he walks out and he comes back in again. And he asked me the third time, I says, would you believe 100 feet? He says, exactly. <laughs> you know. So again, these guys demonstrate that they know everything. Uh, and they sent me back to my room. I remember uh, we got a lot of air raids. We probably got two a day. And you could set your clock by uh, uh, the target times over Hanoi, and uh, which is, you know, and the Air Force did the same thing as I understand in World War II, and they did the same thing at the uh, uh, Operation Linebacker at the end of the Vietnam War on Christmas of 72. I mean, the same routes, they didn't vary. The target times were the same, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, plus or minus. And they've been doing that for two years. Well, we're getting the voice of Vietnam, and the guy comes on. He says, well, the Air Force uh, generals are really getting nervous there in, in the United States because they've lost half of their F-105 fleet. Well, Mike McCuston was an F-105 driver. He was a really funny guy. He says, you know, he says, he says, the best airplane I ever flew, and I only got seven missions. Uh, but anyway, so I'm laughing about this. Oh, they're shooting down 50%. I can tell Mike's thinking, you know, this, his, his ears, the smoke is coming out of his ears. And he says, you know, Robert, he says, that might not be too far off. He says, the guy before me was number 156, and they only built 300 of them. Now, I found out later that uh, <laughs> they built about 800 of them, and they lost about 400 of them. Wow. You know? So, yeah. yeah. And another thing was uh, we only counted fixed-wing airplanes. We didn't count helicopters. I guess that goes to the arrogance of... Uh, Navy and uh, Air Force uh, jet pilots. But they counted helicopters. And, and, and so when they give us, it wasn't as 150, it was like 6,000. That included helicopters. Now, my brother flew helicopters for 14 months in Vietnam. And he was supposed to go over there in July of 67. I was going to come home in June. Well, when I get bagged in May, they told my dad, they says, uh, you know, Richard doesn't have to go. He's the sole surviving son. Of course, my oh, brother geez. would have nothing to do with that. Oh, I've got to go over there and save my brother. Well, the good thing was he got the late of year, so he missed Tet of 1968. But he went over there in 68 and 69. He re-upped again for another 12 months. And finally, after two months, uh, he saw the light. 
And so after a total of 14 months, he says, send me home, and they did. Um, okay, that said, this is at the plantation. Uh, we got a special meal, I think, uh, Independence Day and uh, Vietnamese Independence Day, American Independence Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And then in the uh, spring of 1968, uh, we got moved to the zoo. And we were there for about a month, and Mike gets moved out, and George McSwain gets moved into us in the zoo. And uh, probably we stayed there in that room. Uh, actually, we got transferred to the room next to us. Everett Alvarez used to live there, and then because uh, we talked to him for a little bit, he was the first American pilot shot down. Hmm. First American Navy, well, first American pilot. And we moved into his room, and we were there pretty much uh, 68. Uh, 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 I think Mike McCushion moves out, uh, Charlie Plum moves in, and there was Plum, myself, and McSwain, and then we got moved to another building in the edge uh, of the zoo, and in the May, oh, and then in September of 1968, John, President Johnson stops the bombing. And the Vietnamese stopped using that rope trick. We're still in those little rooms. Of course, the treatment up until now and for the next year or so, uh, we'd be in like a uh, uh, 12 by 12 to 15 by 15 room with either two or three other roommates. We'd be getting out one hour a day to wash dishes, uh, take a shower. Uh, and we'd be getting two meals a day, usually a bowl of uh, green soup, in the summertime with a side plate of, of pumpkin or squash and either a loaf of French bread or a, a big bowl of, of rice. The French bread could either be hot or it could be moldy. Hmm. Um, and then in the winter time, uh, the same rice or bread, uh, we went from green soup to cabbage soup and then usually we had like turnips or rutabaggers as a side plate. Uh, and that was our life. Boring. I could, I was, I count the squares on the ceilings. Um, so that went on, and then we had an escape attempt in May of 1969, and they brought the ropes out again. And actually, about a, just the day before that happened, uh, actually, when Johnson stopped the bomb and the Vietnamese stopped using the ropes in September of 1968, George McSwain, my roommate, uh, another Navy pilot, he decided he was going to fake being crazy. And he decided he wasn't going to bow. He wasn't going to go to interrogations or nothing. And he got away with this from September of 68 until May of 1969. I'm thinking nine months, okay? <laughs> and uh, when the bombing stopped, our food got better. Uh, in fact, well, I can tell you that later. Uh, when we got put back together again, some of the Vietnamese had... Uh, they gained so much weight that I didn't recognize them as, huh. as guards, you know. But that being said, I think a day before the escape attempt, uh, Charlie was out to quiz. That would be Charlie Plum. And George and I were lying on our bunks. And uh, Major Kessler was sitting in the room next to us. And he kind of gets up and we start tapping on the walls. Well, about the time uh, during that tapping, one of the flaps opens up and there's a Vietnamese guard, you know. So I stopped tapping and uh, it looked, it sounded like another guard started running around the end of the building to get to Kessler's room. And I couldn't bump on the wall, which, which was our emergency signal because there was a guard looking right at me. Yeah. Well, George had his head toward the door, so he didn't see the guard there. So George comes up, he does like a push-up, and he starts pounding on the wall. And then he, he you know, then he, and then the, uh, the guard saw him do that. Okay. Well, George is fake being crazy, and, and that didn't compute. So anyway, so uh, the guards open the door, they come in, tell me to, you know, roll up. Uh, so, so I get my, my, my bamboo, uh, whatever, bed and my clothes and blankets, and they take me off and put me in a, in a separate room ne next to the theater. So I'm there, and then the next morning, uh, 
I'm looking out and I, and, and I see these two guys coming in. They're in front of a Jeep. They're running. It's, it's like they, they were in flight suits and, and, and they're all covered with mud, you know, and they got their hands tied and they're blindfolded. And I said, man, we got new shoot downs. We start bombing again. You know, this would have been May of 1969. And then uh, a bunch of guard, actually the camp commander and some higher ranking uh, Vietnamese uh, right in front of my room and I could see they're drawing stuff on the floor, you know, and, and all that. And then they disperse and uh, they come back and uh, one of them has this, this Vietnamese English dictionary that obviously came from my room because before that, Charlie Plum had stole a Vietnamese English dictionary in interrogation and he hid it behind our window, you know. <laughs> and so obviously they searched our room and found that. And also I noticed that there was seven or eight other prisoners who were blindfolded, their hands tied, and they were being marched off to different rooms uh, in the zoo. In fact, I saw, I recognized Mike McCushion. He was in the room on the other side of the theater from me couldn't communicate with him. So I'm thinking, man, something, what's going on here, you know? Well, uh, at any rate, so I'm there in this room for two weeks and my punishment was no mosquito net. So what I did was I took feces, I took urine, rubbed it all over my skin to try to keep the mosquitoes off and discovered that works for about four minutes. <laughs> and then, so, you know, and it's tough because there's a lot of mosquitoes there in, in Vietnam. Uh, usually the daytime, okay, but trying to get some sleep, it ain't going to work. So that was a pretty miserable two weeks. And then uh, I think I was finally taken to an interrogation after almost two weeks. Food remained the same. And they stripped me down and took my pants off. I mean, down around my an ankles, I was belly, uh, belly down on the concrete. There was a guard either side of me with, uh, with a fan belt. Mm. And uh, they started beating me with the fan belt. And after about three hits, the pain curve just goes straight up. And uh, I think the guard said, uh, who stole the dictionary? Who stole the dictionary? Finally, I says, Plum stole the dictionary. And uh, they stopped beating me, sent me back uh, to that room. And then a couple days later, uh, I went back to the room with Charlie and George. And I think they did ask me, you know, how about McSwain? You know, I says, well, you know, George, he doesn't talk to us either. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's hard to live with. <laughs> and I got away with that. <laughs> At any rate, Go back to the room, George and Charlie said they were worried about me because they didn't know what happened to me. And then they told me that there had been an escape attempt. That's when I found out there was an escape attempt. And not only was there an escape attempt, but our room being on the edge of the building, which in that time was, I believe it was, uh, I forgot the name of our building. One of them was the office, but I don't think that was the one. Uh, the escape came out of a room in the annex of the zoo, which was, was a part of the zoo, but separate. And those rooms had uh, seven or eight people to a room, and Dramesh and Atterbury escaped out of one of those rooms. So those other seven people I saw were from that room. And uh, what had happened was they took the ropes to these guys, and, you know, at some point, you, you're going to start talking. And so they says, well, uh, that room were Plum and McSwain, because the Vietnamese thought that George Castler ordered these. In fact, they were jumping on me about... Uh, Major Kassler of Korean, I think he was an ace in uh, Korea, a pretty famous guy. But uh, th th they thought Kassler ordered uh, McSwain to be crazy. And so uh, they were pimping. I says, no, George is just hard to live with. Well, these guys, when, the, when, when they put the ropes to him, they said that our room was the ready escape room. In other words, the next escape is coming from our room, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so my roommates were really worried about me. As it turned out, I got off, I got three hits with a fan belt, and, and I got off fairly easily. But I told Charlie, I says, Charlie, you know, hate to tell you this, buddy, but I told him that you stole the, and of course, he was disappointed, but then he says, well, he says, uh, forget it, you know. At any rate, uh, we're rocking along, and about a week later, we're out in the shower, and they come after George, because they also 
those people in the escape room told the Vietnamese interrogators that George had been faking for the last nine months. Oh, no. You know, yeah. So they come get George. And the last I saw of George was he was butt naked out of the shower and they had him tied onto a bamboo pole like you see a lion, you know, mm -hmm. tied on. Mm -hmm. And then they haul him off, you know. Well, he shows up, uh, I think he showed up a couple weeks later, three weeks later. And his butt was just black and blue. He got 20 hits with a fan belt. Uh, we had some people that had 700 hits with a fan belt. I got to tell you, uh, why that didn't kill him, I don't know. Mm. But it was over like a three or four month period. There was a couple incidences that took place there. Uh, J.J. Cannell was in the room next to the room that they were using the fan belt on people. And J.J. Cannell is the only prisoner who gave only name, rank, seal number, date of birth that I know of. He's a Navy guy. He been, and, and they stopped him because he started faking being crazy and he, he scared the Vietnamese. And uh, they found out that he was faking from these people in the escape attempt as well. Well, they put him in the room next to the, to the beating room with the fan belt. And we okay? Because mm -hmm. I might go back down again. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Uh, and they kept every day, you know, this says, hey, we know you've been faking. We know you've been faking for the last four years. And they kept beating. Well, JJ, he just stopped eating. And the last we heard of him was the Vietnamese took him off to the hospital. And that was the last we heard. There was another guy, uh, I don't want to mention his name, but he was Air Force. He was a wild weasel electronics guy sitting in the back of the F-105. And after he got shot down, of course, he broke like everyone up everyone else did and but the loss rate of the f-105s went up after he got shot down mm -hmm. so he thought he was responsible well he he had a slow spiral he thought his his his, his roommates were communists he wouldn't talk to them and uh, he stopped eating and uh of course, he was under the Cuban program. Uh, they had some guy from Cuba that was doing interrogating for about a year. He was pretty brutal. In fact, he was so brutal, the Vietnamese kicked him out of the country. Uh, anyway, you know, the Cubans didn't like us very much. Well, the last I heard of, heard of this weasel guy was that he stopped eating and they carted him off to the hospital. That's the last, last we heard of him, you know. And then the escape attempt, the guy named Ed Atterbury died. And I was able to live with Bill Baugh, you know, for a while before we came home. And he told me, he says, Robert, he says, you just need to know the personalities involved in that escape attempt. Uh, Bill was in that room. He says, the guy named Dermisi, uh, he was the one that wanted to go. Nobody would go with Dermisi. Uh, first of all, uh, the orders were no escapes without outside help. And... So no one would go with him. Plus, we all thought it was stupid. I mean, it's not like Germany. You know, I mean, these yeah. people are all slant-eyed right, and right. brown skin. You know, it's stupid. Yeah. Well, Dramisi, he says, he says, Dramisi just talked this kid Atterbury into it. And the result was that Atterbury got killed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. So that was the escape attempt. And then in uh, July, uh, treatment got good again. Took the ropes away. Uh, I got moved to another part of the camp, another building. Lived with uh, Howie Hill, uh, Joe Milligan, uh, Terry Boyer. Uh, these guys were all Air Force. And we actually started playing volleyball. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, during this time, how were you doing physically? Uh, from a physical standpoint, you're fairly healthy, or uh, I mean, you're... yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I have no complaints. I mean, I always, I mean, I always had more food than I needed. I only ate half my rice. Really? Okay. But then I'm five six, yeah. and I might have got down to 115 pounds. I got bagged at, uh, I believe I got bagged at 135. On my first cruise, I came home. I was 129 pounds. Got married in July and October. I was 145. <laughs> And when I got bagged in May of 67, I was back down to 135, and I came home at 125. Yeah, okay. You know. Uh, yeah, physically, uh, I really had no problem. The two big problems were hemorrhoids or impacted wisdom teeth. Oh, 
yeah, you, you don't want to get those two. Um, okay, so that was uh, July of 69. Uh, we started getting out playing volleyball, uh, maybe 20 minutes a day, you know. And that's when I noticed that some of these guards I hadn't seen since September, they put on weight so much I could hardly recognize them. Huh. Because after Johnson stopped the bombing, the food got better. Okay. And the Vietnamese guards were getting treated better as well. Okay, somewhere in the summer of 69, we started getting an additional or two meals. We started getting either sweet toast or hot sweet milk in the morning. So now we're getting breakfast. And then in the summer, in July of 1970, a year later, we got moved into compounds. And we're talking uh, 50 people in a building. The building had like seven double-sized rooms, you know. And we are getting chess checkers, uh, Monopoly from home. We're getting letters, writing letters every week or every month. They're getting packages every other month. Uh, I hadn't written a letter, I think, in the first two or three years I was there. And I started doing that after three years. Uh, that was in 1969, 1970. And then in November, four months later, they had the Sante Raid, where, where Americans went in with helicopters to an empty camp. And uh, didn't they're trying to rescue prisoners, and they weren't there. So, well, at that point, the Vietnamese shut down the good deal. Oh, boy. Because we were getting outside six or seven hours a day twice a day for maybe two or three hours, uh, getting two baths a day. We had ping pong with, with, a, with a roof that we could play ping pong in the rain. Uh, again, as I said, packages from home. Uh, the food was, was the same. Uh, uh, it was a country club. Mm -hmm. And then we had the, the, the escape attempt and they run us downtown, which is one thing that missed me off about the other. The other prisoners don't mention that. We'd have been treated that way till we came home. They don't mention that. Uh, some of them say the treatment didn't get better till uh, till a month after we came, till a month before we came home, which is clearly wrong. Uh, at any rate, so they rush us back downtown to Hanoi, and now we got about 50 people from that building in one big room, but it was like a gymnasium, 30 by 60, plenty of room. We're still getting out twice a day, two or three hours each time, two baths a day, still getting our goodies from home, letters. Uh, we're playing chess, chess, uh, Monopoly, uh, bridge. You know, some really good bridge players, really good chess players come out of there. And that was like that. Uh, oh, that's when the, the whatever, the fourth or fifth Allied POW wing got started, like in January of 1971. And what the deal was, uh, the whole time I was up there, I had virtually, the only thing I ever heard leadership wise from the upper echelon and it came from robinson reisner he said you know don't let them torture you to the point of permanent physical damage which i thought was a great policy yeah. you know we used to have a joke because we all knew what the ropes were he said well all they had to do was throw the freaking manacles on the table and we'd, we'd start talking you know but they had to throw the manacles on the table uh but up until that point we were on our own. Well, they put us all together, and then in January, all those senior officers started putting out these directives. And it was like the laws of the Old Testament. I think there were 612 of them. You know, it was, I mean, it was almost to the point, well, if you go to the bathroom, here, here's how you have to do it. I mean, it was really, my, it, was, it was stuff that we had already been doing on our own, common sense, uh, with no input from above. And now the senior officers, and there's probably 20 or 30 of them, they just codified this. And now it was the law, okay? And we had memory banks in our rooms that had to memorize these directives. I mean, and, and, and the junior officers, I mean, we're just shaking our head. Uh, don't get me going on that one. <laughs> right. Anyway, so here you are back there, I believe in uh, the middle uh, of, oh, oh, we took a poll. And the poll was how many torture days? And we came up with 25 torture days, average, per person. And Alvarez had been there for a couple thousand days. I thought 25 was incredibly low for the amount of time we'd been up there, for the number of days mm -hmm. we'd been up there. 
And actually, a torture day, they would count time in the stocks as a torture day. If you were in the stocks for five minutes, didn't hurt, that counted as a torture day, okay? I felt bad because mine was only 16 days, so which meant some poor guy had to spend 36 days to even it out. Yeah. Uh, this makes more sense uh, when I came home, and don't forget, I want to talk about the religious aspect of this. Sure. Uh, I'd been home, uh, in fact, just a few years ago, uh, Mike McGrath put something, well, let me tell you about the, uh, the religious aspect. So they move us back downtown in November of 70, and we have our church service. Of course, we've been doing church all the way. In fact, if you listen to Jerry Coffey, every night we had the Pledge of Allegiance, the Lord's Prayer, and the 23rd Psalm. And the Vietnamese, you know, we didn't broadcast we were doing it, but uh, at least for, the, for the, the year, well, actually for the four months we were in a compound, that they, didn't, we were, they knew we were saying it. So the first Sunday after we come back from the compound, we're back in downtown Hanoi, we have a church service, and out of 60 people, about 30 people in the choir. Well, the Vietnamese come in and say, look, you know, you can still have your church services, but from now on, only four people in the choir, keep it down, because we don't want the civilians to know you're back in town because they want to kill you, and it will make our job much harder if they know you're here. Well, you guess it. The next Sunday, we got 350 people, the top of our lungs, silent night, <laughs> holy night, God bless America, all this stuff. Well, so then the Vietnamese come in and says, okay, no more church services. And the cry goes out, well, isn't that just like a communist? No freedom of religion. You know, uh, judge for yourself. Yeah. Well, a few years ago, I talked to Mike McGrath. He's a, a, a retired as a Navy captain. He was up there in the slammer with us. And he was a president of the Vietnam POWs group. And he, we get a newsletter every three months. In this particular newsletter, he wrote that uh, about this incident with the, them not letting us have church service and basically, you know, they just wouldn't let us have freedom of religion. So I ring him up and I say, Mike, I mean, you know, this is BS. Uh, you know the reason. And he goes, uh, well, that might have been true in your room. Uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. But during that conversation, and here's the important part. Uh, I mentioned, you know, we had some polls out there. Do you remember us having a poll of how many average torture days. And he says, no, he says, I remember uh, we had some polls, the highest and fastest ejection, the lowest and slowest. Uh, Doug Higdell fell off a ship uh, uh, when they were doing uh, artillery duels with the shore batteries in North Vietnam about one o'clock. He went up to have a smoke and he fell off and they, he became a prisoner. The Vietnamese picked him up. He got the he got the, the, the record for the uh, lowest and slowest ejection, 15 <laughs> feet, 15 knots, okay? <laughs> I says, well, does the number 25 mean anything to you about torture days? He says, that's BS. I says, well, is that BS high or BS low? He says, that's BS high. I says, that's BS high? He says, yeah. He says, most prisoners, the Vietnamese popped them for two weeks and left them alone. Uh, and that fit with me. Now, mine was actually about three weeks because it took me a week to, to get to Hanoi. But they basically had their way with me for a couple weeks. Uh, so that just that that's also had a great impression on me. Uh, okay, so where are we now? We're uh, we're still in uh, in the middle of 1971. Uh, we got moved back out to the zoo, except this time we're still getting out a lot. They had they had uh, uh, book buses or book uh, library, and I read all Toy Story stuff and all this freaking stuff. It's real depressing reading. You know, if you want to read that Russian literature. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, they were, you know, they're still trying to do the good thing. Uh, we're getting our packages, all this kind of stuff. Well, this is the middle 1970s. I believe we started bombing again in 72. Actually, I believe we started bombing in the latter part of 71 because in the fall of 71, the Vietnamese loaded us up into a bunch of trucks, and we went up north 12 miles south of the Chinese border. Ooh. Yeah, they thought Hanoi was gone. Uh, we noticed that the village next to us used to have the loudspeakers with the music and the, the news. All of a sudden that stopped and we looked out there, we could see the windows are all taped up like hurricanes, you know. Uh -huh. uh, those people were gone. 
And so we figured what they're gonna, and they took about 200 hundred of us up to the south of the Chinese border, border like in the fall of, of 1971. And they told us when we got up there, they says, you guys are not gonna go back to Hanoi until the war is over. And then you're only going back for processing. Uh, well, so we're up there in a beautiful country. Uh, in fact, the food got better. We're getting uh, corn mixed with uh, the rice. We're getting buffalo meat uh, once a week, a little square of it with the gravy, plus our side plates and, and either rice or, or bread. Uh, I believe we're still getting our packages, writing letters. Yeah, we're still writing letters, uh, gifts every other, you know, every other month. So n none of that changed. And then one night, it was in January, I'm living with Eddie Meckenbeyer. He had an abscess tooth. Uh, uh, I had to rub his neck, uh, you know, because it was real painful. We hear a truck roll in. So he, I get up on his shoulders because I'm the little guy looking out one of the vents. And here comes his truck. And then there's another truck comes in. Eddie, there's three, two, four. Eddie, there's 14 trucks. We're going home, you know. And I'm all excited. My stomach churned for like 24 hours. <laughs> anyway, so uh, they start loading us into these trucks. And we're heading back south to Hanoi. And I remember Bill Baugh and I were in one truck and, and we're under a canvas. They didn't want us to get our heads out of the canvas. It took us like four hours to get to Han back to Hanoi. I think it took like a day to get up north. Huh. I mean, of course, just we're going downhill uh -huh. and we're smoking. But the, the carbon monoxide and the gas uh -huh. are coming up and Bill and I, we're getting, we're getting ready to puke our freaking guts out. Finally, I said, the heck with the guards, I will take the can and I puke out the back and they gave us a can. So Bill and I shared the can, puking into this can all the way back into Hanoi. Uh, that was a small price to pay for, for going back to Hanoi. I do remember that we went in in the early hours of the morning, it was still dark. I believe it was the Doma Bridge. Uh, we couldn't go across it because it was all bomb. You could see the silhouettes of the broken spans and stuff, you know. You could see the lights, you could see the workers up there with their uh, uh, torches, blow torches, trying to put this thing. And, and there, was this, there was this Vietnamese sing-song music in the background. You know, mm. It was really weird, oh, wow. really wow. weird, you know. Anyway, so we get back downtown. Uh, we go back into the, the main camp there at the Wallow, the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, the other prisoners are there. Uh, uh, they didn't know what happened to us, but they all start waving and shouting our names out, you know. That was in January. I think a couple days later, they read us the Paris Peace Accords, and uh, we had an order to go home. I think it was 115 per month, something like that, depending on how fast we withdrew the troops. The first 115 went home. Uh, we're talking uh, the sick and wounded and the old guys, the old timers. And then they had a special group of 20 that I was in. And it was a goodwill gesture by the Vietnamese. And the night before I was supposed to go, the Vietnamese come in and says, okay, Weidman, uh, you're not going, but uh, Jim Bailey is because his father's gonna die in four days. And if he doesn't get home, he won't see his dad before he dies. So I got swapped out. And that group of 20 went, uh, they didn't wanna go. In fact, as I walked out, they said, you're a lucky, you're a lucky guy, man. Well, the bottom line is, is they would not go. And so then the plane came in to get them. The two pilots had to come in and, and, and Jim Perry was the leader of that group. And uh, Jim Perry sent a message back to Norm Gaddis, who was a senior ranking Air Force POW. In fact, I was in his room. And uh, the message was, uh, we're not gonna go until you order us to go. He says, uh, recommend you order us to go because these two pilots are saying, if we don't go, it's gonna create an international incident. So Norm Gaddis ordered these guys to go. So then they, they went out, got on the plane, and went away. Yeah, why wouldn't they? Why didn't they want to go? Uh, because it was it was we, we had a thing. Uh, you go in order or shoot uh, down. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, okay. And, and they didn't like that. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so the after that happened, then I get called out to a special quiz, and there's this guy with a nice freaking like a Marine uniform. It wasn't the khakis, and he had his little hat on, you know, and. He says, how come, how come you got bumped? You know, I says, you mean you didn't bump me? He says, no, he said, that came from your side. And I says, well, you know, I had, I have no idea. 
He says, they, they offered 20 as a goodwill, you know. Some literature came out later, years later, decades later, uh, basically said that, uh, well, uh, that they got restricted to, to, that the U.S. wanted Bailey to go. They wanted 21 guys to go. But then this person said that, well, the buses only would take 20 people, so the Vietnamese had to eliminate one. Uh, that's not how this went down. My name was yeah. picked out because when I got on, finally got on the plane uh, a couple weeks later, uh, the guy that was, was basically my escort in the beginning, he says, hey, we had three names. We, we figured, okay, one guy's got to go to get Bailey on. Bailey was Navy, so that eliminated to the Navy. And we had three JGs, you, Plum, and, and some other guy. Well, uh, and, and so we picked straws, and you, you were the guy. So I just accepted that. Uh, truth of the matter is, and when I think about it, you know, well, why didn't they just go by order of shootdown? Yeah, right. You know, because Plum was shot down a couple of weeks after I, I don't know about the third guy, you know. So that story was a little fishy. Anyway, uh, so a couple of weeks later, uh, I get to go home. And, you know, we go out there to Guillaume and had our buses. And by the way, you could fit three people in a seat on the bus. I mean, you had 20 seats, but you, they were wide <laughs> seats, you know. It was, that was bogus. <laughs> At any rate, um, that's basically the story. You know, I come, uh, I got released. I can remember that uh, I cried. Get the wheels in the well. We knew <sighs> we were going. I yeah. cried, you know, no yeah. going back now. Yeah. And we showed up in the Philippines, uh, had a you know celebration. We had to salute uh, some admiral, and uh, they announced our names. And then they put a flag up. We had to salute the flag. I mean, it was all out there. Get on the bus and go go to Clark Air Base. Uh, I do remember Clark. There was the ground. The guys that came up uh, were prisoners from South Vietnam that came up to Hanoi three months before we went home. About a hundred of them. They were in really bad shape really bad shape and in fact they were in such bad shape that uh, they got home maybe a, they got to Clark Air Base a month before I did they're still there they're hooked up to gurneys mm. IVs I mean they were in awful shape mm. uh, they were getting these guys fixed up so they could at least get fixed up enough to fly back to the states um, but that was it